So hi guys, uh, this is our last session, uh, marketing talks, and after this we we are going to have a group photo. So after that <coughs> we are having a dinner uh, just uh, eight minutes walk from here. So I hope uh, you all are going to be joined with us. Uh, and now let's start with uh, the marketing talks, starting with healthcare list. So hi everyone, good evening. I know that everyone is tired. I can see it in your faces. I'll just take quite some of your time and just quickly wrap this up. I just wanted to brief you about what Health Catalyst and what we are looking for. So basically Health Catalyst is a US based healthcare company uh, which focuses on data management, analytics and services. So why do we tell data management because we store in patients data in our engines and we provide it into uh, different hospitals whenever the patient's data is needed we are there to help them out with the patient's data okay so that is why we tell our companies a data management company and why analytics and service basis we have different uh, set of clients that we provide our services to so we tell analytics because we do research and we draw insights out of it and we tell and provide different insights, do researches and give insights to different hospitals, may it be insurance uh, to give a particular area of what care they need and etc. So that is why we call analytics and database services as well. So moving on. So this is how Health Catalyst has come into place. So it is basically, basically established in 2008 and it is headquartered in South Utah. Um, and uh, we went public in 2019 and we are spread over seven locations and we also have 125 plus clients all across. So um, coming to Health Catalyst India, it was uh, acquired by Health Cat KPI Ninja has been acquired by Health Catalyst and in, on February 2022. Back then, it is just 25 employees that we had, but right now our headcount has reached up to 110. That means it leaves a lot of scope for rapid growth to hire a right person in right position with right skill set. So that is what we are looking for. Um, in going forward, we are planning to grow as a company uh, 2x and 4x so we are looking forward to it so now i just wanted to you people to hear from our uh, what is health catalyst about from our ceo co-founder and some of our clients so here we go <laughs> Before Steve Barlow and I founded Health Catalyst in 2008, we had the great privilege of working at Intermountain Healthcare in Utah. They had asked to build an analytics system to support their clinical integration work. They couldn't easily access data and they didn't have an analytics platform. Steve and I had identified a need to provide a solution that blended data, analytics, and professional services expertise. In a nutshell, that was the beginning of Health Catalyst. Steve and I helped our first customers achieve results in record time, and we built our analytics platform from the ground up based on everything we'd learned working inside of healthcare. We unlock the potential for data-informed decision-making and sustainable change. We do this by giving our customers better access to data from hundreds of sources. We give them a clear picture thanks to dashboards and visualizations and world-class support from healthcare experts. Health Catalyst has always been on a mission to partner with our customers and help them focus on the most meaningful opportunities and achieve higher quality care at the lowest appropriate cost. And we're committed to that end objective. We had a lot of information, but none of it tied or integrated together in a way that we could actually make sense of things in a reasonable way. We had a big electronic medical record, and that was a huge database. But that was separate from patient experience, that was separate from demographic information, that was separate than cost information, that was separate from some operational performance measures. So if we wanted to try to figure out the best care delivered at the best value for the community, at the best cost of production, at the best outcome, we had to actually tie all that information together in the best possible way um, for the communities we serve. We look for a different solution. That's uh, really about the time that Health Catalyst was born and it's been a really wonderful um, relationship that's had a whole lot of meaning for many individuals because of the improvements we've been able to make. Hello, I'm Dan Burton, the CEO of Health Catalyst. 
Health Catalyst is a leading provider of data and analytics technology and services to healthcare organizations. Our solution consists of three parts. First, a data platform, which integrates data from hundreds of sources in a flexible, open, and scalable manner. Second, analytics applications built to highlight opportunities for measurable clinical, financial, and operational improvement. And third, our services expertise to help our customers effectively realize those measurable improvement opportunities. During the next few decades, both margin pressure and the move to value-based care present economic complexity and dramatic change for healthcare organizations that will continue to require data, analytics, and improvement expertise. The pressing need for healthcare organizations to realize clinical, financial, and operational improvements will continue to drive the need for our solution. With more than 300 data sources, eight analytics applications, a library of analytics accelerators, and more than 250 analytics and domain experts, we are poised to drive measurable improvements. Thank you for your time and for your interest in Health Catalyst. We invite you to join us in pursuing the worthy mission to be the catalyst for massive, measurable, data-informed healthcare improvement. So that is it just about what Health Catalyst is really about. So how do we measure our success? So Health Catalyst measures success by a number of patients' lives that we've saved or improved by partnering with different organizations using our technology, data, and analytics service. So this is how we measure our success. So apart from that, what do we do basically is we also conduct uh, learn learning labs so the past topics that we have did few workshops on is i am essentials and um, healthcare improb improbability in india so we conduct all of these workshops within our office itself we educate uh, the um, people who are interested in learning certain skills or how a particular technology is helpful in which way. So we educate the people to learn the skills and uh, registration for all of this uh, workshops are free of cost. So we do not uh, take any money from the participants who are coming in. And uh, the next coming upcoming workshop is on September 21st, as you can see over there. So it is uh, on orchestry and elevate your ETL pipeline. So that is also given by our team itself in our office. So if you are interested, you can uh, see a barcode over there. You can scan it and get yourself registered in the workshop. And a few of the upcoming workshops that we have over here is uh, we are planning to do certain other workshops that are related to um, FHIR and uh, strategies for improvement improvement of healthcare and uh, payer collaboration. The other workshop that we are planning to do is on Power BI and Databricks as well. So if you are interested, please do reach out to us. We'll help you out to get registered to all of these workshops if you are interested. Okay. That is about it. And the big thing is right now we are looking for a rapid hiring growth and uh, we are looking for the people who are interested in certain positions over here as stated uh, we have stated the role that is required the experience and the open positions that are op like the number of positions that are open as well so we are opening for 16 roles as in for now so if you have any referral profiles that you want to pitch in, we are, we'll be there. Sai is one of our uh, team member. He'll also be here. I and Sai will be outside. If you want to you know, uh, refer anyone or you want this job or you w want any description of what Health Catalyst is about or you want to know more about Health Catalyst, we'll always be here. And we also have this um, DL over there, healthcatindia.hiring at the rate india.com. So you can also send your referral profiles over there. Our recruiting talent acquisition will take the referral profiles forward. So this is us. Thank you all for patiently listening and for your happy smiles over there. Thank you. Hello. 
Hey, hi, good evening. Uh, myself, Hari Krishna. I'm from AWS, Professional Services. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, first I will start with uh, a quick and show of hands who are using AWS. Quick show of hands. OK. And those who are not are my potential customers. <laughs> OK. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll be uh, wrapping up very quickly. Uh, I'll not waste much of the time. But uh, and I know that we have a evening dinner plans. And if you have any further doubts, we can catch up over a couple of beers. So this is uh, uh, a new concept. Uh, which is prevailing in the market, and especially we try to promote, and we call this as a purpose-built databases. So unlike legacy thought process, right, you start with a monolith databases, OK? You try to push all kind of data in single databases. Now, as your workload grows and different business demand grows, you try to push different types of data, actually. Now, that could be a NoSQL data, that could be graph data, that could be OLAP data, and all of that. And you know that eventually, you are going to really have performance issues, actually. So rather than that, what we really try to promote here is, is purpose-built databases. Means you have a different types of workload, and there is a database out there which we are offering and you try to leverage those kind of databases, and you will not really have any kind of issues for that, actually. And that's the mantra what we follow, actually. OK? And on the right-hand side, you will see that the purpose-built databases, what we have is key value store, document, caching, graph, time series, ledger, white column, and memory. For each of those purpose, what you have, the, depending on your workload type, you leverage this. And we guarantee that you're going to give you the optimal performance, actually. So we're trying to really change the mindset what you carry right from the monolith databases, where you had huge monolith databases, and it has all your performance and scaling issues, actually. Rather than that, break those things, and then try to move those to the respective purpose-built databases. Now, the two databases, what we really have here is one of the, I would say, the, uh, the flagship product, what we call as the Aurora databases, and the other is the RDS database. Let's see that how we have really built some of the features around this. It's not working. OK, so this is one of the our flagship uh, product called as Amazon Aurora. OK. Uh, now, this is built on the, the open source, uh, two flavors what we really release. One is the MySQL and PostgreSQL, actually. But the indigenous technology, what we have built is the something which at this storage level, which gives you the performance of 5x for the native MySQL and 3x for the uh, PostgreSQL, actually. On top of that, you have a lot of other managed capabilities which around that, actually, which we are going to talk in the next subsequent slides. RDS is something, uh, I would say, a relational databases, but it offers into really other engines also. Like you have RDS SQL Server, RDS Oracle, and in addition to that, you have other engines also supported, actually. Now, you might be wondering what is the difference between RDS and Aurora. Aurora is something which we have built indigenously. It has a lot of optimization, especially at the storage level. And that's where you get the real performance and the availability and the reliability what Aurora offers, actually. RDS is something which you can really have the, some of your legacy system move to that, OK? to your proprietary system still carrying on that. And if you have further plans to really get rid of your licenses, everything from your Oracle SQL server, you move to the Aurora part, actually. Okay, So it has all of these features, what it is now being displayed. And you have multi-AZ and, and the uh, other manageable features. Uh, this, uh, I would say, service, we have been using it for the last 14 years. And it's quite reliable in terms of how it is being offered. Now, some of the recent announcements what Aurora and RDS offers, this is something which we are going to really take, talk about. Now, this is uh, the, the limitless part, uh, which is the, uh, still in the preview part, actually, limited preview. Now, this is one of the very interesting part is we have seen that a single monolith cluster of PostgreSQL okay, can really have issues. Okay? Now, how really we deal with such problems with that, especially with the performance issues? You might be having a workload which is running into petabytes of data. You cannot really scale <coughs> vertically. So what is the way to do that, OK, and to really mitigate some of those issues? 
So here we are coming up with a feature, rather a service called as Aurora Limitless. Okay, it is, is basically on the sharded technology. It is serverless, means you don't have to really do some provisioning on the high. So some of those provisioning is taken automatically. So as your workload increases, you behind the scenes, your compute and memory gets added on the fly. And if your compute or your workload is decreasing automatically, it is going to scale down actually. And obviously, you are going to pay only for the services or for the time which you are going to use for the capacity which you have utilized it, actually. OK, this is one of the very interesting features which we have really come up. And it's still in the limited preview section, actually. But customers or any of your use cases or your company is having such sharding capabilities where you are really maxing out any of the issues in terms of size, scale, performance. This is the way to go. And this is quite limitless because you can have n number of shards which you can scale horizontally, actually. OK? <clears throat> uh, this is uh, Amazon Aurora Postgres zero, zero ETL integration with Amazon Redshift. Now, you might be having a hybrid kind of a workload where you have an OLDB workload or an OLAP workload. So typically, you want to really move the data from your OLTP to OLAP. Now, how do you typically move to try to copy the data or move the data is using ETLs, writing those complex ETLs. And, and, and it's a very time consuming part, right, to write all of those things. But instead of that, you, we have a feature called a zero ETL integration with Redshift. That is, you have an Amazon Aurora, OK? And you have your OLAP database, which is called as Redshift, actually. So with the zero, zero ETL integration, with just few configuration changes, you can really move your data from your OLDP database to OLAP database and continuously have those data really moving from your left to right, that is from the OLDP to OLAP databases, actually. OK, so this gives the customers a lot of capabilities to really have the integration between the typical OLAP and the OLDP database with very minimal efforts what is required. Unlike you have a lot of ETLs to be configured, Right? So this is kind of a, one of the innovative features which we have come up. Aurora IO optimized. Now, uh, many of the customers, or rather any, I have, do we have any customers or anybody who's having had any kind of an experience of IO, extensive IO issues? No? Good. But in case, if you ha happen to have any Aurora I.O. issues, and, and I'm sure that uh, there might be also some observations saying that uh, there is, when I see my bill at the end of the month, I get a huge I.O. bill, actually. OK, that is, the billing is normally on your compute, OK, the storage. And, and for the I.O. intensive workloads, your I.O. billing is quite high, actually. Now for for those kind of a workloads, we have really have experienced customer pain points. And then we have tried to address that using this feature called as Aurora I optimized. So with this feature, what happens here is you are not really going to pay for the IO charges, but some of those charges have been absorbed in your compute part, actually. So in overall, you have at least a 30% gain in, your, in the performance and reduction in your overall bill, actually. OK, so this is the IO optimize. It is just a, a, a option you have to select while you are configuring your Aurora cluster, actually. OK, so this is, as I mentioned, right, uh, for especially for customers who are having extensive IO workloads. OK, but the question might also come, OK, is that an option if I have an extensive IO workload and I can directly switch on to this? No, that's not a way to go. You try to tune your workloads. OK, if you, there is nothing you can do about it beyond some of the tuning part, then you go for this. OK, but this should not be the first option. You should be using it. Ideally, you should be really doing, tuning some of those IO part queries. It could be queries. Identify those, tune them. And then there is nothing room for improvement. Then you go for this kind of a feature, actually. So in this, what it happens here is it is kind of a you are able to really predict your per, uh, billing at the end of the month, actually. So you are not going to get some surprises at the end of the month saying my bill is really gone three times. IO bill is three times more than the compute part, actually. Uh, <clears throat> again, uh, this is uh, optimized reads for Postgres compatible addition. So what we have seen here is, uh, this is for the last data sets. We have seen that you have a data set which is exceeding your memory, actually. And that gets spilled in your uh, the temporary part, OK, storage, actually. Now, 
whenever you have that spilling really flowing to your temporary storage, actually, you have a deteriorated performance, actually. Okay? And especially when there are large kind of uh, sorts happening, okay, indexing happening, actually. So in those kind of a cases, you have this option of called as optimized reads, actually. And we have seen customers really reaping the benefits up to 30% cost and improvement in the performance because we are using some of the NVMe-based storage, which what happens here is the, all those sorting happens uh, within the storage, and this, uh, that, that gives the, the required performance what the customer is expecting. PG vector, I did not tell more about this because at least I think two or three sessions we have seen since morning of what is the importance of PG vector. Obviously, you have this capability within the uh, Amazon Aurora and RDS actually. So I will not really emphasize more on that because it's, it's kind of already proven that how PG vector is really becoming a boon to for all our uh, vector embeddings and the AML use cases actually. So this is, again, a very good uh, feature where we say that blue-green deployments. So this is especially be useful where you have a uh, lot of planned, unplanned, uh, planned activities, I would say, more, like the major version upgrade, schema changes, okay, and instance scaling and engine parameter changes. So usually, uh, we see that there are a lot of planning needs to be done for these kind of activities, and there is a downtime involved for that. With this feature of blue-green deployment, there is a minimal downtime required because you are already doing a lot of copy over your green part, and then you just flip it over, actually. So a lot of those orchestration layer, what you need to typically do and plan for these kind of activities taken care using the blue-green deployment, actually. So this is how you can really leverage and try to minimize your overall downtime for your organization whenever you have these kind of an activities. Yes, so PG Active is something which uh, uh, is, is, is quite interesting also, and then I would not say, uh, I would say not say contradictory or uh, there's a controversy over there, but uh, very interesting use case in terms of active-active. It, it's a very vast subject, and I think uh, uh, there were a couple of topics on this subject. So active-active, again, uh, I need not tell there are multiple nodes wants to do the right at the same time. But this is with the help of an extension, which is an open source extension. And Amazon also have done, or rather contributed to this action. So basically, this active-active extension is, is, is trying to help or set up having a multi-master kind of a requirement. This is not, in a true sense, I would say a multi-master, where you have high concurrency workloads, where multiple writes are trying to write on the same row, and then you have that, OK? So you, it is based on a rule-based ones. So you predefine some of the rules. And then when you have a multiple nodes trying to write at the same time, actually, then based on the rules, how do you really tackle those situations, conflict resolutions, and all those is something which is going to be taken care of by the PG Active part, actually. So this is, uh, we are seeing uh, momentum, but not that great. But uh, we have seen some of the customers really taking, uh, using this feature. And, uh, and, and then there are some plans to really take this ahead and contribute back uh, to the community, actually. Uh, RDS with multi-AZ with two readable standbys. So this is, I, I just want to emphasize on this, this is a feature which is available on the RDS and not the Aurora, what we're talking about. Because this is something which we have a, typically, you have a multi, rather one primary and one replica, OK? But we are talking about here with a one primary and two replicas, and that two in a multi-cluster node, and that two in the two different availability zones. OK, and those two standbys are readable, and that can be having, uh, rather, the use case is something that, for this, you would have a high availability part, OK, because you are giving the getting in the two different availability zones. And then you are also really solving some of the scaling solution because you have two standbys, actually. So you can redirect all your read queries to the, the, to the readers as much as possible, actually. So it is giving you the read scalability with the two multi standbys, and the high availability also is, is there. Uh, trusted language extensions for Postgres. Uh, this is, I think, one of the very uh, underrated feature, but then it's very powerful feature. Uh, I think uh, very few of them know. So we all know that uh, in the uh, Postgres ecosystem, okay, there are few hundreds and 
of extension and i think there are some talks which uh, my colleague or my friend is going to talk about there are more than 200 extensions in the postgres ecosystem now all of those extensions uh, may not be really be able to get onboarded to uh, rds or aurora because of several reasons actually so rds or aurora only supports only few set of extensions actually but there are few extensions which you think is going to be really useful for your use case but it is not supported that you can really get onboarded on your uh, RDS or Aurora using this extension and really have them and use that, provided all those extensions which you're trying to get, okay, is supported by only the languages used by this. So I think there is C and a few other languages which are supported by this extension. So make use of this extension, PGTLE, and get your favorite extensions as a part of your ecosystem, actually. Okay, so this is a very nice, cool feature. You want to really uh, make use of an extension which is not yet supported by RDS or Aurora, but still you want to use this. Optimize reads, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, again, we're talking about both RDS and Aurora, and that's the reason it is getting, a, it's a repeat kind of a slide, but this is about the RDS part, actually. Earlier, we were talking about the Aurora. It's still based on the same uh, NVMe-based SSD block storage, because when you have a block storage which is on in the NVMe and the SSD, things are quite, quite fast, actually. So all those local sorting happens on this local storage, or, okay, unlike your EBS, which has a limited IOPS capability, actually. Yes, that's it, and uh, thank you for your time, and uh, see you at the dinner. Thank you. <laughs>